Well, hey everyone, it's great to be together again. I know I say that every time that we do this, but it really is. Um, I look forward to um, at least being with you virtually if we couldn't, can't be together physically. Let's have a word of prayer before we uh, dive into the message today. Dear Father, we thank you that we can um, gather together virtually today. We thank you for the fact that we live in a free country and that we can still uh, meet this way. I know in other countries where they can't meet together uh, physically, they would love to be able to do it this way at least, and they can't even do that. And Lord, we just pray that um, you would be with our brothers and sisters across the world that are in, in uh, suffering under persecution. We just pray that you would um, just strengthen them today and encourage them. And Father, as we uh, continue to battle the COVID-19 virus. We pray for our leaders that we, you would give them wisdom and understanding as they they try to um, make decisions uh, regarding our our welfare as well as our our economy. Lord, I just pray that you'd help them to be able to balance that out and to know what they should do. And uh, we know they're under intense pressure uh, both ways. And Father, we just Thank you that we have leaders that are willing to step up and, and be in positions like this. And Lord, we pray that rather than criticize them, we would lift them up in prayer and encourage them. And Father, for those that are on the front lines, our nurses and doctors and um, EMTs, paramedics, uh, firefighters, p police, all of them, Lord, we pray that you'd uh, keep them safe today and we we praise you and thank you for people that are willing to do that and lord as as well as people that are going to work so that our um, the basics of our economy can keep going those that work for delivery companies and um, and many other businesses lord um, we pray that you keep them safe as well especially those that have to come in uh, daily contact with the public lord we just pray that you would uh, keep them safe, and Lord, we pray that we will be able to uh, come out of this and um, still be intact and, and have not lost too many people, Lord. And we just pray that you would give us grace and strength at this time. And Father, we, we thank you now that we can have the opportunity to uh, just look into your word. And Lord, we pray that you guide us into your truth today and help us to apply it. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I remember when I was probably junior high age, somewhere in there, we were at church. It was a Sunday night, and the the person that was leading the the song time asked people for their favorite scripture passage. And as you can imagine, you know, there were people that said you know, John 3, 16, Psalm 23, passages like that that everyone knows very well. I'll never forget my grandfather, who usually didn't speak up very much, raised his hand and said his favorite passage was Psalm 1. And I remembered thinking, what does Psalm 1 even say? You know, I'd probably read it, but he, you know, when he said that, it, it was kind of a curveball for me. And that night I went home and I read it. Because I was thinking, what is it about this psalm that made it his favorite? Now, I'd heard him say other passages of Scripture were ones that were his favorite as well. But that night, Psalm 1 was in his mind. And I thought, what is it about this psalm that, that stood out to him? And why would he say it was one of his favorites? Well, what I want to do is take us through that psalm. Because I think as we read through it and study through it, we'll see how it, it really has a lot of practical implications for us right now. Let's take a moment and read through that. Psalm 1, it only has six verses. It says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, 
and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Right at the very beginning, says it says, How blessed, how blessed is the man. Well, we'll stop right there. You know, we think of the word blessed and we think, well, I, I've been blessed because I have this or that or whatever, but we don't stop to think what the word means. The word means very simply, happy. Happy. So you could change it to say, how happy is the man? How happy? Now you think about this. What is the world striving for? What are they going after? Everyone wants to be happy. How do we get that? Well, this passage is one of the ones that tells you how you can be happy. Now, the, the flip side is, if you don't follow what this passage says, you're not going to be happy. That's pretty basic, isn't it? And yet, so many people miss it. He says, how blessed, how happy is the man. And then he goes through some different things, and we're going to break this down. Um, the happy man, or really the godly man, you can interchange those. A godly man is going to be happy no matter what his circumstances are. And it's an inner happiness. It's not that he's giddy and, and that kind of thing. But there's an inner joy. There's a peace. There's a happiness. There's a contentment there that he has. So the position of the godly man. And actually, it it's actually goes from the negative, where he is not. Number one is his walk. Where isn't he walking? Well, number one, he isn't walking with the wicked. It says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Well, the wicked here are those, in the, in the Hebrew, it's talking about those who hate God. And it talks about, it actually has a connotation of turbulence and restlessness. And it has to do with the confusion in which the wicked live and the perpetual agitation they cause others. You know, there's a lot more there. It's, it's sin, talking about people who are sinful, but it's talking about their, their lives are turbulent and, and it, it, it just agitates everybody around them because of the sin that they're living in. And it says the godly man, the man who is happy, is not seeking the advice of those kind of people. He doesn't live by the advice of those kind of people. He wants nothing to do with what they have to say. So if they would say, hey, you need to do this, he would probably do the opposite. Because these people, according to Proverbs, these are fools. And he doesn't listen to them. So he doesn't seek their advice. He doesn't seek their counsel. He wants nothing to do with it. Well, that doesn't mean that he isn't around them. Because the Bible says we have to be in the world. We have, we have to be able to have someone to witness to. And so it's not that he doesn't spend any time around them. But the world in its mentality does not rub off on him. He's to have an effect on the world, not the other way around. And so he doesn't seek their advice. He doesn't walk with them. And it talks about his stance. He doesn't stand in the path of sinners. Um, sinners here in the Hebrew refers to someone, someone who sins habitually. Uh, it, it, it actually can refer to a criminal. Um, someone who breaks the law of God constantly. 
It's their way of life. Now we all know that the Bible says in Romans that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So in this, it isn't saying that he's not around someone who sins, but he's, he does not stand with them. He doesn't follow their conduct. Um, the idea here is that he isn't going around with them in their sin. The law has um, something in it called guilt by association. And I, I know some people say, well, I can, I can go out and I can be with them while they're doing this stuff and do, you know, carousing and, and carrying on, and I can, I can be with them, but I just won't partake in what they actually do. Well, I know someone very close to me that was actually out with people who were um, smoking marijuana. And he wasn't doing it, but because he was there, the police showed up. Guess what? He got hauled off to jail with the rest of them. Why? Because he was there with them. It's guilt by association. And the Bible says that we're not even to, to do anything that has the appearance of evil. And so we have to be really careful not to be around people and in a constant setting where they're doing things that are that are sinful and wrong and and so we have to be really careful on that because after a while we can have that guilt by association people look at us and say wow he must be just like them but there again our lives are to have an effect on the people that we are with and not the other way around. So his walk isn't with them. His, he's not standing with them. And it says he doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. I think other uh, translations say the scornful. The idea here is that he's not with people and participating with those who scoff or ridicule or deride God and his people. They have no time for people that are going to sit there and just make fun of God and his people. They're, he doesn't have, he's not going to sit there and participate with them. And he's certainly not going to sit there and tacitly be in agreement with them. He means to silently sit there and say nothing when they're making light of God and his law and his truth. You know, we have to be careful. Um, I don't know how many times it's happened in my life, when I, especially when I was younger, you know, in high school and that, when people would, would um, you know, make fun of other people or say things that I knew wasn't right that went against God's law and his command, and I didn't say anything. And there's guilt there in your heart when you do that. You know, you, there's remorse when you walk away and have said nothing. Now, that doesn't mean you jump down people's throat who are sinners and you know, beat them over the head with the Bible. But you don't sit there and participate with them. They should know that saying things that are derogatory towards God are not going to fly with you. And they're not going to be okay. So the godly man doesn't walk, he doesn't stand, and he doesn't sit with people like that. So that's the position of the godly man. What about the purpose of the godly man? We've talked about what he doesn't do. What does he do? What's his intent? Well, verse 2 tells us. It says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and, li day and night. He delights in the law of God. He, his, the word of God is something that he enjoys. He can't wait to read it, to understand it, and to apply it. Psalm 119 verses 1 and 2 say this, How blessed, there's that word again, are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, 
who seek him with all their heart. They seek the Lord with all of their heart. They, they, they really desire to have this relationship with God and, and their intent on studying God's word. Now it talks about the law of God here. Now this is an Old Testament passage. They didn't have the New Testament there. But in the New Testament, in Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What is the greatest part of the law? And what does he say? He says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And so for someone who's delighting in the law of God, whether you're reading the Old Testament or the New Testament or both of them, what is the one thing that you're going to hone in on? It is this, to cultivate and grow in your love for your God. That is the great commandment with all your heart, soul, and mind. And another passage says, adds your strength. Every part of your being is going to go after loving your God. And then it says the second one is like it. Um, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it says on these two commands depend the whole law and the prophets. He's saying, look, you can boil it all down to this. Love your God and love your neighbor. Now there's a whole lot that goes into that. And obviously, you know, we have... 66 books that go into a lot of detail on how we go about doing that and it talks about the love of God and we see it illustrated in the Old Testament we see it communicated very clearly in the New Testament through Jesus Christ and what he has John done and first John talks about that um, you know if you look in first John 4 especially it talks about loving your God and loving your neighbor and if you don't love your neighbor then you obviously do not love your God because you cannot separate those two. But he says his delight is in the law of God. He wants to know his God, to understand him, and that will pour forth from his life into his relationships with other people. He delights in loving God and his fellow man. Um, and it says, the idea here is he meditates on God's law constantly. It says, in his law, he meditates day and night. Psalm 119.11 says this, Your word I have treasured in my heart, that I might, may not sin against you. Treasured God's word in your heart. Why? So you won't sin. Verses 15 and 16 of that same chapter say, I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. This is a man who loves God, loves his word, and meditates on it all the time. It's not just a cursory reading. He's trying to understand exactly what God's word says so he can use it in his life. And that's the point of scripture. Um, and here's something we need to understand. This is a, a, a quote that I read somewhere. It says, With increased knowledge of God comes an increase in love for God. The more we know about our God, the more we're going to love him. And so if you want to increase in your love for God, increase in your knowledge of God. All right. So we've had the, the position of the godly man, the purpose of the godly man, now we're going to look at the planting of the godly man. The planting of the godly man. It says here that he is firmly planted by streams of water. In verse 3. Um, he'll, be, he'll be like a tree that's firmly planted. That means he, he remains close to his source of spiritual nourishment. It says he's planted by streams of water. That's a great place for a, a tree to grow. Um, lots of nourishment there, lots of water, and it's um, very easy for the tree to grow. 
but his roots run deep in order to handle the storms of life. Um, and that's key for us. As we grow in Christ, a lot of the growth happens in ways that other people cannot really see. If you've ever seen a picture of a tree where they've taken it, they show the tree above ground and then the tree below ground, there's a lot of times more of the tree underground than there is above the ground. That tree, in order to be strong and, and, and to weather the storms that are coming, has to have a great root system. And that's exactly what God is telling us here. He's saying, look, if you want to weather the storms of life, and we're kind of in a storm right now, if we want to get through this and be strong, we have to have roots that go down. And the only way to do that goes back to the second point, and that is growing in our love for God and our understanding of his word. That is how we put roots down. And then it gets tested in the storms of life. And we are transformed by that because we take the, the truth of God's word, we use it in our life and realize, you know what, this is awesome. Because when the storm comes, all of a sudden, instead of being just thrown around, I have an anchor. There's a great hymn that says, we have an anchor for our soul. And we have that in Jesus Christ, our Savior. There's a great illustration of this that I, I like to use when I'm talking about this passage. When I was in college, I worked at Baptist Medical Center in, in Kansas City, Missouri. And I was a groundskeeper there for the summer. And I noticed one time when we were out mowing by one of the streets that went by the hospital, there was this great big tree. Um, I could not reach around it. It was a huge tree. And it was just off of the curb of the road, not too far off. And I noticed one day that there was, was a cross hanging on that tree. And I asked my boss about it. I said, what is that? He said, well, I've got to tell you. He said, several years ago, some teenagers were flying down this street. And they didn't realize that there was a curve in the street right there. And they were going way too fast. And they jumped the curb and they smacked into that tree and both of them in the car were killed. Now that's pretty sobering. But I remember looking at that tree and thinking, these guys were probably going, to, they said about 55 when they hit that tree. But the tree, just a few years later, showed no signs of damage. You imagine a car weighing several thousand pounds going flying down a street, smacking into a tree. That had to be a pretty good jolt. And yet that tree was just fine. This passage is telling us we can be just like that tree. That no, even if something horrendous comes at us and hits us unawares, it might shake us a little bit, but if we're firmly planted, in the word of God, and in our love for our Savior. Oh, it'll shake us a little bit. Might knock a few little br loose branches off. Some leaves might come down. But we're going to be okay. Because our roots are down deep. And that will bring healing to us. And we'll be fine. So we're firmly, he's firmly planted says he yields fruit. Now this isn't a one-time thing. It says he yields his fruit in its season. So this, the, you know, a fruit tree, you know, they, they, you know, if they're healthy, they, every year they will yield fruit. If we are rooted in our Savior, it will show on our life. It's, it, this is very simple. This passage is really basic. It's not a, a really complicated passage. And the idea here is, look, if you're rooted and grounded in your Savior, 
it will show in your life, period. End of discussion. Um, it says his leaf doesn't wither. So when there's difficulties, you know, there's times of the year, sometimes when it gets, there's a drought. If our roots are down deep, the leaves are going to be okay. Then it says, he prospers. What comes to our mind when we think of that? It says, whatever he does, he prospers. Well, right away, in our carnal way of thinking, we think about money. You know, right away we think, all right, man, if I follow God and do all this, I'm going to get wealthy. Well, that's the health and wealth gospel. It's bogus and don't believe it. Because um, if the health and wealth gospel is true, then all of the apostles obviously couldn't have been followers of Jesus Christ because they all died broke. So if, if that's the case, then all of the apostles were the worst reprobates out there and we shouldn't believe anything they have to say. And that's, that's the long and short of it. This isn't talking about financial gain. Now, Remember, Old Testament passage, if they followed God, he did promise to bless them. And so for them in the Old Testament, it may have carried some financial gain with it. But that isn't the promise to us from a New Testament perspective. For us, it's much deeper than just financial gain. What it's talking about is spiritual gain. Whatever we do for the Lord whether it's in business or whatever, it's going to have an eternal impact. I want to read something to you. It's a quote from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. And it says, Two qualifications need to be noted. First, the fruit. That is, the prosperity is produced in its season and not necessarily immediately after planting. Second, what the godly person does will be controlled by the law of God. So if a person meditates on God's word, his actions will be godly and his God-controlled activities will prosper. That is, they will come to their divinely directed fulfillment. They'll come to their divinely directed fulfillment. We cheapen it when we just think about finances here. We will prosper spiritually. It will have an eternal impact, both in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Here's something, a quote that I, I read a long time ago, and it, it's, its truth is timeless. It says, what you believe determines how you behave, and both determine what you become. What you believe determines how you behave. You can look at your actions and that will tell you what you believe. Are you like this godly man that's firmly planted, that does not walk with sinners and, and, and partake in their sinful actions, but rather delights in the law of God? If that's true of you, look at how you behave. It, it's, that's what the book of James is all about about our behavior if we're following Jesus Christ. And they both determine what you become. Because if you look at your life and say, okay, here's what I believe, but my behavior actually is actually telling the truth about what I believe, then I need to change. And I need to walk according to what I say I believe, that is the word of God. And my, the outcome will be much different. The last verses here can be summed up pretty easily. Verse 4 basically says that the wicked leave no eternal heritage. It says, The wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. You know, we think about them in, in terms of what they're doing now, and sometimes wicked, the wicked people seem to prosper in this life even. But according to this verse, there's going to be no, nothing eternally that's going to carry over. Um, 
and in verse 5, um, it, it says they're separated from the righteous at the judgment. It says, the judgment comes, sinners over here, the wicked over here, the righteous over here. And as we know from other passages, um, they are cast into the lake of fire. And then finally, it says in verse 6, it says, way will end in ruin. The way of the wicked will perish. Not just the person, but in the end, there will be no way of wickedness. When Jesus Christ returns, there will be no wickedness, period. And so there won't even be the way of wickedness. It won't even be an option. It says they will, the way of the wicked will perish. Now it does say in there, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows the way of the righteous. If this is talking about in an eternal standpoint, he not only knows the way, he is actually been planning it for a long time. Here's something I want to leave with you. It's an illustration from scripture. There was a king in 2 Chronicles 21. His name was Jehoram. He was an incredibly wicked man. And in his wickedness, he ended up, when he became king, he killed his brothers so they couldn't take over the throne. And he just went hog wild in being as wicked as he could. And he was hated by his people. Listen to this. This is gruesome, but it is something that we need to, to listen to. 2 Chronicles 21, 18 through 20 say this, So after all this, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable sickness. That doesn't sound very pleasant. Now it came about in the course of time, at the end of two years, that his bowels came out because of his sickness, and he died in great pain. That sounds horrible. He hated God, and God finally had enough and just said, here you go, and gave it to him. But listen to this. It says, And his people made no fire for him like the fire for his fathers. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and he departed with no one's regret. And they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. They couldn't stand him. He was so wicked that the people couldn't stand him. They, basically, their attitude was good riddance. Now, most of us, even people that, are, that have, do not know the Lord as their Savior, um, most people still have people who mourn when they die. So I'm not saying everyone is like Jehoram. Okay, but do we want to follow a path that could lead to the life that Jehoram had? So that at the end of their life they say, have people say good riddance. We don't want that. We want to have it at the end of our days people stand up and say, this man, this woman blessed me so much that they would, you would have people standing in line to walk up front and say, God used this person in my life. They were such a blessing to me, let me tell you. And so your testimony carries on even after you're gone. That is what happens with a godly man and a godly woman. They leave a heritage of godliness that is passed on. And I want to encourage you today, 
Be that person that leaves a heritage of godliness. And then when, that when you get to heaven, you stand before your Savior, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your reward. That's what we want. That's what we strive for. It begins with staying away from sin and loving our God and his word. It's as basic as that. And we will be transformed. That is what we desire. And when we do that, we can withstand the storms of this life and be a blessing in the midst of the storm. Let's be a blessing to all of those around us by showing godliness to the world. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you today that we had this privilege of studying your word. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be rooted and grounded in your word. Help us to love you as you, I say this a lot, but as you deserve to be loved. And Lord, help us to love the world as you love them and to be a light in the darkness. And Father, I pray that we would leave, leave such a heritage of faithfulness and of godliness that people will be driven. They will be compelled to come to know you as their Savior and follow you in like manner. Lord, we thank you today that we serve such a great God. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.